Well, welcome back to Transitional Justice at 4 p.m. Hawaii time on a given Monday. And today we're going to talk about something we've talked about before, which, but which is dynamic and has changed and in a sense has gotten worse. The military takeover in Sudan. Um, and our, um, I guess our, our guest who has been with us discussing the same subject over time is Mutasim Ali. Welcome to the show, Mutasim. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jay. Great to be here. We also have uh, Ahmed Abdul Shafi Toba with us. Can you introduce him to our viewing audience? Of course. Um, yes, Ahmed Abdul Shafi Toba is uh, a co founder of the Sudan Liberation Movement Army. This is a movement that was uh, founded uh, uh, a little more than 20 years ago uh, to um, respond to um, systematic marginalization. Uh, in Sudan and to promote political change. Um, and uh, I would definitely leave it to him to further introduce himself and his activism for better Sudan. Sure. Well, welcome to the show, both of you, Mutasim and Ahmed. Really appreciate your coming down. This is a very hard time in Sudan. Mutasim and I talked about it a few weeks ago. And um, as we left the story, it looked like there would be peaceful protests in Khartoum and elsewhere in Sudan, and that um, ultimately reason um, and peaceful protests would prevail. But that has not happened, has it, Mutasim? Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, after years of struggle, right, for, um, for change in Sudan, um, even after, the, uh, after removing the Africa's longest dictator, uh, Omar Bashir from office, um, the Sudanese people are yet to realize um, uh, change. Uh, and that is because um, the elite and the military uh, institution continue to hijack people's revolution. And the recent events in Sudan is a, you know, demonstrates uh, how um, military uh, institutions in countries like Sudan hijack people's revolu uh, revolutions, people's hopes. Uh, but what is fascinating about what is happening in Sudan is that people are determined, despite the brutality and ruthlessness of the uh, military and the militias in Sudan. Ahmed, uh, you've been following this closely, I'm sure. You're, you're in Baltimore now, but um... Uh, you must be following this day by day because uh, you have been associated with the, um, the, the as an activist or liberation uh, movement in Darfur and, and Sudan. Um, so uh, what is the current state of affairs in terms of um, uh, the violence? Uh, we, we thought this would be uh, peaceful, but it hasn't been peaceful. And, and the violence has accelerated. Uh, can you talk about it? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it is very unfortunate to come once again and uh, in the middle of uh, what is happening, people are just uh, finding their way out of this uh, great pandemic that left the whole world paralyzed. And uh, with the hope in Sudan that people will uh, walk out of the pandemic and um, find their way towards uh, a uh, democratic, peaceful democratic transition. Unfortunately, um, as if Sudanese people are distant to uh, believe in a such horrible um, life under uh, totalitarianism and dictatorship. Um, however, the people of Sudan are very, very strong people, very resilient, and uh, they have demonstrated a um, couple of times. Um, their, their aspirations and their hope that they are looking to go towards democracy. Unfortunately, the reckless general, uh, the leader of the coup, has uh, dashed all that hope um, and the gains that these people made in the last two years um, out of that uh, December 2018 revolution. Um, Unfortunately, we are back to square one. Uh, this coup uh, has huge setback uh, for Sudan's progress. And um, unfortunately, the leadership of this coup 
uh, know nothing but killing. Uh, they are all implicated in uh, wars, Darfur. Um, you know, we have the whole world have seen the, the genocide, uh, the wars in the southern east house of the Sudan, the Nuba Mountain, the Blue Nile, and even in the capital of Khartoum when they brutally dispersed the city in uh, that resistance. And um, they're all implicated. So now, once again, uh, we have, have seen in the last two days that. Uh, the killing and the better arrest of the activists and the government officials from the Hamdok's cabinet. And yeah, we don't expect anything good out of any military uh, you know, rule. So this is this is just expected. Well, the mask is off now, isn't it? I mean, because they're using tear gas. Uh, the military has arrested hundreds of people, detained them. The military has um, used violence in the street. The military has killed uh, dozens of people in these protests. At the same time, the people who are protesting, am I right, have remained peaceful. They are doing peaceful protests. They are not responding with violence. Um, the sad thing too, correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, the military is going backward the 2019, you alluded to that. Uh, the military is putting people who were officials for Bashir back in office. They're returning to the time of the dictator Bashir. H am I right about that? You're absolutely right. Um, we, the observers and the Sudanese people knew from the day uh, that the F uh, CFF of you know, sign that uh, partnership with the military to uh, to form a transitional government. Uh, from the day one, people have noticed the so the nature of that partnership wasn't going uh, well. Uh, however, people they bite the bullet, and then for the sake of the transition, they kept going and they're trying here and there. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, the very same generals of Bashir, uh, they did the same thing. They they they, uh, they violated the declaration, the constitutional declaration, and uh, now they put us back into square one. Um, fortunately, the Sudanese people were very alert. They went to the streets, millions of people across the world, and now the the generals they are isolated at home, isolated uh, across the world. And uh, sadly, it looks like the general is going ahead with his own plans. And despite the resistance of the Sudanese people and the rejection from here and there, uh, unfortunately, the, the decision, the political decision is not in the hands of the, the, the puppet, the general. Yeah, Mutasim, you know, we, when we look forward a few weeks ago when we discussed this right after, I guess we discussed it right after the coup, we, we thought that, um, that it would be resolved somehow peacefully. Um, but that hasn't, that hasn't happened. And I, I have two questions for you. One is what, what, we, know what we know what motivates the people. Uh, they want to have a, a, a reasonable democratic representative government. Uh, they've always wanted that. Um, but what motivates the generals to try to stay in power and use violence to do that? What is what is their agenda here, and what do they? What do you believe they hope to achieve? Yes, this is a, a very good question, uh, Jay. I think there is a singular objective for the military leaders and um, and uh, those uh, who support them. By the way, um, yes, there are. You know the, the 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 military takeover was conducted by the army generals, but also supported by uh, other parties who um, joined the government as part of um, you know a political uh, deal, right? A peace agreement, uh, a quote unquote peace agreement in uh, Juba, the capital of South Sudan, in twenty twenty, and so there somehow uh, support the military to take over in Sudan. 
And I can tell you, Jay, just to answer a question, um, you know, the, their prime objective is to avoid accountability. These army generals, um, the, the leaders of the military um, take over in Sudan, are all of them um, complicit or perpetrated um, crimes against the people of Sudan, uh, specifically in the region Darfur, western part of Sudan, in the um, in South Kordofan, and in Blue Nile. And as Ahmed mentioned, even in Khartoum, in the capital of Khartoum, in 2019, during the sit-in, they killed more than 127 protesters, of um, whom uh, there, there are more than 40 of them. Um, you know, were actually dumped in the River Nile. These are the same army generals that are leading the country today, uh, not to mention other crimes across the country. And so uh, because they fear uh, accountability, and this is actually one of the demands of the Sudanese people, the demands of the uh, democracy protesters, accountability, and investigations for the crimes in Sudan. And so that's part of the reason why they do not want to give up power. Mm -hmm. um, and I think their only protection is to hold on power, but this is not a sustainable. Uh, Bashir was in power for more than 30 years. Uh, Bashir was removed by the Sudanese people. Um, before Bashir, there were number of governments, right, were removed by people. And so, yes, now they're holding in power to, you know, to avoid accountability, but sooner or later that accountability will happen. Uh, but yes, that's the only motivation. Not that they're trying to protect their wealth, because they, you know, they have, of course, maybe this is one of the reasons they have enough wealth, but I think their, their main motive is to avoid accountability. Ahmed, um, you you would like to see a um, a resolution of this, of course. You would like to see some agreement, such as the agreement that was reached before, the power sharing agreement between the civilian government and the military government. Um, what are you seeking now? What is what do the activists want, and how do you think they can achieve it, and can they achieve it? Well, thank you so much. Um, what we want is a civilian-led government that is tasked with the um, the certain specific agenda. Um, this agenda would make the government as a caretaker government uh, set the stage for uh, the transition. Uh, that will end up in elections, and then the people will choose their own leaders. Uh, how to get there? That's a big issue. Uh, are they the, the military trusted partner? No, not. They're not. They, uh, they, they left no room for trusting them. Uh, people trusted them before, and they in horrible way, they, they, they just violated that, 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 that trust. And now we are in a situation, uh, the streets of the Sudan, the people of Sudan, the demand is one. No partnership with the military because that is not their job. They are not trained to govern, they are trained for a specific job. Let the politicians, the, 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 the people choose the revolutionary leaders, national leaders, who can set a path towards a peaceful transition that will um, pave the way for a democratic transition and put an end to this horrible cycle of who after another, who after another. Now, we cannot uh, isolate the internal factor from the, um, the outside factor because it is very important also to see the bigger picture the region of Horn of Africa is, uh, 
it's a very uh, fragile um, region. Uh, a lot of wars in Somalia, wars in, now we have war in, in, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, in Sudan, and also across the, the Red Sea uh, region. This geopolitical and economic of this region makes it very much interesting, There's so much. And all the, re the, the Indian Ocean and the Horn of Africa region and the Middle East, all of them are intertwined and so much interest is invested there and everyone is struggling to influence the political uh, decision in this region. Now, we are paying the price of such a situation. What are the, the best uh, policies that can you know, avert such situation? It's the interest of everyone in the region to see a peaceful, democratic state of Sudan. But unfortunately, that is not what's happening right now. A lot of uh, influences and exploitation of the situation in Sudan, uh, and we're not able to get there. So it is important to understand the, 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 the external, the, the outside dimension uh, with the internal dimension that uh, Motasi mentioned in order to uh, have a clear picture of what's next. But what I see right now, the, the military generals, they have no political decision in their hand because they are puppets. And it's only the Sudanese people that look uh, and can, can regain uh, the, the power and regain and reinstate the civilian led government. Well, you know, Nutasim, <clears throat> Ahmed suggests that, um, you know, this is a regional matter and goes beyond any particular country. And I guess uh, what that means is it's not a coincidence that you have trouble in adjoining or neighboring countries and that there are people crossing the border, um, you know, having an effect and fomenting unrest, uh, fomenting coup, fomenting violence. Um, and I wonder, we, you know, we were talking briefly before the show about the, um, the connection, if you will, between what's happening in Sudan um, and what's happening in right now, um, Ethiopia. And I suppose, uh, as Ahmed said, you know, we, we should look at uh, uh, Somalia as well. Um, and, uh, and you were also mentioning Rwanda. Uh, we had a show with uh, uh, Project Expedite Justice concerning Rwanda and the genocide in the early 90s about that. I wonder if you could uh, give me a picture of how this works, of how the, the trouble in one country affects, the, you know, uh, other countries. And somehow people cross the border and create a problem in neighboring countries. Can you can you talk about that for a minute? Sure. Um, I just want to you know you know to emphasize what Ahmed was mentioning of the regional context. Um, here, particularly speaking of Sudan, right? Um, you know, as he mentioned, the army generals are not acting on their own. They actually. Um, implement regional, um, you know, um, um, agenda. Uh, they, they they are being used by regional powers without naming them at this point. Um, and unfortunately, what we see in Sudan is not a unique situation. Uh, we have Eritrea, right? It's still as as an unstable uh, country. Uh, we have Ethiopia now. Uh, we've got. Um, you know, the Tigray region forces and the Oromo uh, movement, again, they're sort of, you know, um, moving ahead to, um, you know, to topple the, uh, the government of Abiy Ahmed, Ethiopia's prime minister. And, you know, and we have examples in the past, right, that we spoke, as you, you mentioned prior to the show, uh, about Rwanda, and there are many other examples, the Republic, uh, Republic of Congo, uh, Central African Republic. And so all of these conflicts, uh, of course, you know, there are, as, as I said, regional and international interests. But in the end, I think uh, 
you know, uh, as much as they influence the region in general, but I think um, for the people, let's say in Sudan or in Ethiopia, um, because they lack political leadership that can lead people, right? We can always blame the, or internal struggles to foreign, um, you know, actors and all of that. But in the end, I think uh, the people of the uh, specific countries, Sudan in this case, um, need to have a strong leadership that can um, deal with all of these um, elements, right? Uh, because in the end, we would never end the uh, foreign interest because this is what we'll, this is the world we live in. There will always be interest, uh, and so how are we as a people uh, going to cope with uh, such complexities? And I have to say, in our case in Sudan, uh, so far we have failed to uh, deal with uh, our domestic issues, and we have failed to come up with um, policies that will uh, address all the foreign interests uh, as, as, uh, as well as domestic interests. And so that's that's really. But I think um, speaking of uh, examples that we mentioned prior to the show, Rwanda. And I think, uh, you know, it is unfortunate that, you know, what happened in Rwanda, um, you know, continues to happen elsewhere in Sudan today and in Ethiopia it will happen tomorrow and there's nothing, uh, you know, actually we, we, we don't do anything to, to actually stop that. And this is really the unfortunate part, right? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, at this point, I don't want to say I, I lost hope and faith, but I think um, the only thing that I can say is that uh, all we can do is to mitigate the, 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 the damage that, uh, uh, you know, it, it, that is going to happen. And this is very unfortunate uh, because I know that these conflicts and wars are pre uh, preventable, uh, but then um, you know um, we're playing politics, and this is primarily in the international community. Just today, in the United Nations Security Council, I was just watching a you know sort of a, a session about the situation in Ethiopia, and you can see that uh, even though countries agree that what is happening in Ethiopia is uh, probably going to be a civil war. But then there's a disagreement on how the international community um, acts. Uh, and this is again because of you know, international interest and this is very unfortunate. Well, Ahmed, I wanna to talk to you about that. You, uh, you mentioned that and, and um, you know, from, from this discussion and from the discussions we've had before about Sudan, in, in the absence of um, a, a, a reasonable, responsible um, governing attitude by by the military um it looks to me like we're going to have violence here and the only way this can be resolved is uh as in the case of bashir where the people take the dictator down they take him down uh, and then the people get back in charge again and they create a representative government but <clears throat> between now where we are right now and that time it strikes me that we will have to have violence do you agree Well, this reminds me with the uh, the justification uh, that uh, F uh, FFC put first when they signed the the constitutional declaration. They said that this partnership with the the military um, is primarily to avoid uh, civil war and to avert. Uh, fragmentation of the state and to help if the pass towards the democratic transition. Well, it was a good uh, agenda. Uh, unfortunately, the very partners that they cohabit together into this uh, transitional government, uh, the one who turned against uh, the, the, the pass towards uh, transition. Um, they're the one now uh, detaining people unlawfully. They're the one killing the very 
people who fought and people who toppled the, uh, the Bashir's regime. Uh, what is the difference? Uh, there, 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 there is nothing other than uh, expect the worst from the, from the, from the generals. What about uh, the international community, Ahmed? Um, you know, it's a mixed bag in Africa because the international community colonialized uh, most of Africa um, and um, did not, you know, create a representative government um, culture, if you will, a, a legacy, if you will. And, uh, and so when they left, or whatever the process was in leaving, they left some of these countries without representative government that was sustainable. So this is a mixed bag. And then you say, well, maybe we need the international community to come back and be more active, the United Nations, uh, the EU, <clears throat> the US. What would you expect them to do? What should they be doing? And what are the risks of, 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 bringing, of asking them to come back and doing it? Well, it's ironic to say that in this situation of Sudan, um, when the British left Sudan, Sudan was, was even better off, which is very strange. Um, at least Sudan had uh, the best civil servant um, uh, system in the whole cont uh, continent of Africa. Um, we had huge development projects. Uh, we had uh, foundations for a greater development um, in, in, in the Africa, and especially in the Horn of Africa. Sadly, the interventions of military in the governance has stood that all aside. And every time a military coup takes place, people go back to square one. It's number one. The, the, the region is, uh, like I said, is an interest for regional and international uh, powers. But they should know that their interest is only safer and secure when there is a, a stable democratic uh, state, uh, namely in Sudan, because the, 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 the strategic position of Sudan is a glue for the Horn of Africa, of the north of Africa towards the south of Africa. Uh, there is this strategic source, the River Nile, uh, which is now, there is a competition over the, over the River Nile, Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Uh, the, these resources makes the region of Sudan is so interesting. And I, I remember it's on the 29th, October 29th, before, uh, after uh, following the, the, the horrible coup, uh, President Biden said that the situation in Sudan and in Darfur uh, present a threat to United States national uh, interest and national security. Uh, now, before that, having former President Donald Trump. Well, do you, do you uh, want more? Do you want more from the United States? <laughs> do you want more from Europe? Do you want more from the United Nations? Uh, yes, you know, okay. Sanctions haven't really worked. The United, United States has withheld $700 million to the military uh, government in Sudan. Um, that hasn't worked. They don't seem to care about that money. Uh, what, what would you want um, Europe and the U.S. to do to help, if anything? First of all, we appreciate the, the fact that they, they condemned uh, and deplored the, 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 the coup and their call for the reestablishment of the civilian-led government. Uh, but that's not enough. Um, what is needed now is to stand strong uh, with the people of Sudan um, in their request for a civilian uh, government and to put those uh, words in action. Uh, how, what, what, how, what, how, Ahmed, yes, how would you want? That's what I'm coming. Number one, the 
the military, they are not a partner in, in the governance. They should, um, they should, should stay at, at the barracks. And we have unlawful militia that is horribly killing people all over the country. This one, this should be, you know, rendered a terrorist organization because they are implicated, they are involved in the, um, the massacres in Khartoum. Um, they are involved in Darfur genocide. They are involved in New Madrid, everywhere you go. And these are uh, looting the resources of the country, of the nation. And when there's no resources left for the people of Sudan and there is no security, this is a direct threat to international peace and security. It has to be taken seriously. Security Council, the European Union, they, would, they should outlaw these groups. But number, number two, they should sanction those people, not the people, because the people of Sudan have been under sanctions over 30 years. They lost everything. Now we are trying to come back. And it, once again, we have these people jumping into the uh, ranks of power and taking the Sudan back, this is not acceptable. The, we understand the interests of other nations and the relation, the bilateral relationship that they're building is this um, um, cult. It's not gonna, it's not sustainable. If they want a, a sta secured interest, sustainable, it has to be established through uh, the people's power. When the people are in power, I'm sure their interest is safer and secure, and that will will help everybody. But with these gangs, no way. Uh, you know, uh, one one thing with Tassim, you both you both referred to leadership, and um, maybe what's missing in in at least some of these countries, maybe what's missing in Sudan, um, is is um, modern, progressive, strong. Um, you know, uh, popular leaders who are qualified and competent to be leaders. And if you had that, maybe that would help, not only in Sudan, but maybe uh, also in Ethiopia, Somalia, Rwanda, what have you. Um, and it strikes me that the two of you, Utasim and Ahmed, you are the new generation. You are the ones that understand these issues. You are the ones that understand the need for leadership and what, 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 what you need to have as a leader and what the leader needs to do. Am I right about that? Is there a generation of Africans like you guys who can step into that role and, and, and correct this and improve this? Um, not only in uh, Sudan, but everywhere where leadership is necessary. What do you think, Mutasib? Absolutely, I 100% agree with um, that. The, there's a, a generational change in Africa, and I, Sudan is just an example. When you look at the Sudanese protesters today, all of, the majority of them are young protesters, right? Majority of them were born just during the Bashir uh, regime, but they are very resistant to autocratic regime and they're very persistent uh, for their call um, to democracy and, and peace. And I think this is very helpful. And I think this is sort of, it became a trend, right? In Africa in general, uh, there is a movement in Algeria, there is a movement in Tunisia, there's a movement in Gambia, there's a movement in Uganda, and other ways. So, so basically, this is really what is helpful, um, you know, in the in the continent. Um, and I, I would like to say also in other countries in Latin America or Asia. Uh, but in the case of Sudan, I think this is really very inspiring to see uh, young people protesting for democracy. This was not the case, uh, you know, uh, two decades ago. Um, but I, I would like to uh, mention something to you what international community can do, America and Europe. I think this is really very important uh, because in the end, it is important for the people of Sudan to continue their fight for democracy and change, but I think they need international support. And number one thing, and I think uh, Ahmed already mentioned, is that uh, you know, 
the international community, uh, from in America, for instance, there's something called uh, Global Magnitsky Act. The essence of this act is to uh, designate uh, individuals, right, for economic sanctions, for travel um, bans, or for asset seizure, right? This is this is go this would be very effective, right, to sort of limit um, the the movement of the um, uh, of the coup leaders in Sudan, let's say. Um, and so if only, you know, acts like Global Magnitsky Act sort of globalize, right, not only in America, but also elsewhere, I think that's going to contribute a lot for change in Sudan. Um, and, you know, as we always say that uh, the military leaders are very strong, they're very powerful, right? They, they, they're, you know- they, they have the guns. They have the guns, they have the money. That's what gives them the legitimacy. Uh, but the, the will of the people is uh, stronger. And I, I, I see that happen and the termination in the Sudanese people. And so only if that coupled with, uh, you know, with international assistance to designate individuals like the leaders of the militia and the army in Sudan as uh, for economic sanctions, for travel bans and all of that, I think that will contribute a lot to uh, promoting change in Sudan. Well, thank you, Mutasim. Ahmed, we're almost out of time and I wanna give you the last word here, okay? I hope Mutasim no doesn't mind if I do that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Ahmed, Ahmed, can you talk about, um, you know, this new generation of leaders, including you and Mutasim and others uh, who understand what it means to do leadership, who understand what it means to achieve uh, a representative government, um, is that happening? Where is it happening? How do you see it unfolding in Sudan? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? That's very important um, um, in the context of many, many countries, especially Sudan. Um, today, it's not 60s, it's not 70s, it's not 80s, and the early 90s that were uh, oppressive uh, totalitarian regimes um, can impose their will um, on or against people. Um, people aspirations are different. Today, people in my hometown, Zalingi, for example, they are in internet. I mean, they see the whole world. People are talking about climate change. People are talking about uh, virtual classes. People are talking about uh, businesses, uh, multilateral. And all this, we are not part of that because of the system has just failed us. And not only the system, it's the, the political elites, those uh, with an old, old beliefs and ideas that does not translate into modern generations um, case. Um, people at the age of freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of travel, freedom of, of faith and everything, you cannot just impose a will the way I, I, I live, the way I, I speak, the way uh, I want to be, you know, when I have the right to run for office, I have the right to do everything that I want. With totalitarian uh, system and beliefs, it's again, it's all this. So it is now, it's called people's power. It's not military's power. Unfortunately, we have to test uh, the, the people, again, is a, a gun, and that is not going to work. So the people will go into the street, and the generals, they will go to the barracks, and that is coming. But uh, the military, the coup leaders, um, they will not survive, because people are determined, already uh, at the grassroots, people are well organized, structured their resistance committees, and they're working towards that achieving. Uh, today was the beginning of the of uh, of the civil disobedience, which was announced by the um, uh, FFC, and even tomorrow is the second going to be the second day. Uh, the 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 coup leaders they they felt isolated, they are failed, 
They asked so many people to form their government. They couldn't because people are rejecting it, refusing it, because it's the same as the will of the people. So there's no way they can, they can govern because you cannot govern just like that. And I think the young generation, they strongly uh, feel about it's their future. Uh, it is the, their way of life. So they have identified their agenda and they are moving forward with it. Um, no one can stand on that pass because when the will of the people is the general's guns will not. So I believe this is a, a, a global, it is a continental, the African young people are coming up and they want a see an end to this dark era of coups and civil wars and they want to they want to see a democratic free world that they can fulfill their aspirations and live for the betterment of their life. Thank you, Ahmed. We wish you well. We want to see the same thing happen. Hassan and you. Ahmed, I really appreciate you coming. I really appreciate you telling us what's going on um, and your aspirations for the future. And um, uh, of course, we wish you well. We want everyone to wish you well, everyone to support you, and we want you to succeed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate Jake. it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Aloha.